All right, how are you guys doing today? Good, I hope. Let's begin. So this lecture is about the mechanics of seabed sizing. And this is kind of a contentious subject because people have very different opinions about what's correct, what reasons you should bet, and why you should size stuff. I'm going to go over some general heuristics as well as some of my own personal research. Now, before we get started, I want to run a poll. What do you guys think dictates bet sizing? Okay, I've just launched that. Feel free to select multiple answers. Let me know what you guys think. Okay, we've got some mixed results here. So, nut advantage. Here's a lot of people agree there. Range advantage, polarity, SPR. Yeah, and the truth is everything does factor in to some degree, some more than others. And it's not always clear why or how it works. Let's start with some very basic heuristics. So, a nut advantage indicates an advantage near the top of your range. You have all the strongest hands. They have mostly bluff catchers relative to that range. A range advantage is more like an equity advantage throughout. The top half of your range is stronger than the top, than the top half of theirs, and so on. Generally speaking, nut advantage dictates sizing. Range advantage dictates frequency. That's a very rough indicator. It's not always correct, but we're starting with the basics, right? Now, when most people learn, they go about something like this, right? They'll start by just range betting every flop for a small size. Uh, as they study more, they'll learn, okay, dry board equals a small flop bet, a wet board equals a big bet. And a lot of people just stop here. And if you study with a silver a bit more, you'll learn, okay, well, if it's too wet, then we have to size down again, right? You can't just go bombing all the monotone boards, right? Um, and as you go on, you develop more advanced heuristics based on texture, SBR position. And all of that is fine, but none of it actually explains why certain bet sizes are preferred. It's just something you can glean from studying solvers. So I want to start with this, what we'll call the wetness parabola. Um, this is a very basic sizing heuristic. It has some truth to it, but it's obviously oversimplified. So a very dry board, for example. Typically, you'll bet small. As the board becomes more dynamic, there's more draws. Typically, you'll start to size up. And then as it gets too wet, you'll start to size down again. Does anyone use a similar heuristic to this or have they when they were learning? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you guys something. Why do you think it is that we start sizing down when the board becomes too wet? And again, I'm going to launch a poll here. This time it's single choice. You can select one. Why does the bet sizing decrease when the board becomes too wet? Too many equity changing runouts. That's a popular one. Too many middling hands in range. Too many nutted hands to contend with. Interesting. So we're going to explore exactly why that happens. And I think the answer may surprise some guys. So let's go over some of the, the basic factors that influence sizing. Again, the biggest factor comes down to the relative nut advantage in each range. Right? If villain has very few nutted hands that can make your value range indifferent, then you are allowed to bet bigger, right? Because their value range, their nutted hands, are their main defense against overbets and extended aggression. And the converse is also true. If they have many nutted hands in range, for example, maybe a monotone board or you know, a paired board, well, in that case, they can make your value range indifferent. And that prevents you from being too aggressive. Now, villain may have many hands with reasonable equity against the top of your range. This may be an indication that you should bet bigger. Or they may have, uh, you may have a lot of fold equity. If you saw my last lecture, I don't define fold equity as how often they fold. Rather, I define it as the value of fold equity, which is to say 
how much value did you actually gain folding out those hands? Right? If those hands have no value against you, did you actually gain anything by making them fold? So lots of draw equity, lots of equity against the top of your range makes you want to bet bigger. And if those same hands have no equity against the top of your range, you'll typically bet smaller. Of course, you have to consider if you have sufficient nutted hands or even value hands in your range and the number of middling hands in your range. If you have fewer middling hands to protect, well, you're allowed to bet bigger because less of your value range is devoted to protecting the middling hands. Of course, the opposite is also true. So before we proceed, please reach out to me with any questions you may have. Feel free to type in the chat or just speak up. If it's all going well, let me know. All right, let's proceed. So let's go on with bet sizing mechanics. Villain's nut hands prevent you from overbetting them to death. This is why nut advantage is such a strong indicator of bet sizing. Range advantage actually isn't a huge indicator of how big you should bet. Dry boards tend to have low incentive to bet big due to the low value of fold equity and lack of draws against the top of your range. As we discussed in the last one, if you get them to fold a hand that has literally no equity against the value portion of your range, it's not actually such a huge win. Um, so wet boards tend to have a higher incentive to bet due to a larger, higher value of fold equity and more draws that have equity against the top of your range. Extremely wet boards tend to have a wide variety of nutted hands in both ranges, which prevents you from overextending. The top of both ranges get dragged down towards the middle, and if you start bombing like a very wet board, you can become quite exploitable. The middle of your range drags down your nutted hands as these hands need to be protected. The more middling hands you have, the more protection is required. And this, of course, relates to polarity. So let's start with just an overbet indicator. One of the most prominent indicators that I could personally find are situations where a large portion of your range is currently ahead of most of villain's range but your equity with these hands is not reflected in that. So for example, you are currently ahead of 98% of their range, but you only have 80% equity. This discrepancy between being ahead now and not so much later creates an incentive to bet very aggressively. It doesn't really have a name, so I'm just going to call it the vulnerable nut theorem. And let me show you guys a few examples of this. So we have the classic ace-king-5 board. Uh, these are very commonly known to be overbet boards, but let's take a look. So let's take a look at a hand like Ace-Jack. Now Ace-Jack is ahead of pretty much all of Big Blind's Ace-X. It has 82% equity. And big blinds only hands that beat it are two pairs in sets. And they only have about 3% of those in range. So you're ahead of 97% of their range with ace-jack, yet you only have 82%. Uh, similar story with ace-queen. So what do you do when you have a hand that's way ahead of most of their range, but doesn't have that much equity. Well, you overbet. Show you another example here. So this asymmetry means two things, but in strong top pairs, a lot of incentive to play aggressively. More importantly, big blind doesn't have the nutted hands to prevent us from overbetting. So here's another one we have. It's small blind versus big blind, single raise pot. And we can see here that small blind has nines and Big blind only has about 2% of hands in their range that are currently ahead of nines. Yet this hand only has 77% of equity. So if we look at that, nines is currently ahead of 98% of their range, yet it only has 77% equity. And again, this discrepancy, this vulnerable nut theorem, whatever you want to call it, is an indicator that these hands want to play very aggressively. Not only because the value of fold equity is quite high, but also because they can't fight back. And so we'll see here that, for example, nines 
prefers a 300% over bet, <laughs> if given the choice. Same with 10s, jacks, ace-8. All of these hands are currently ahead of like 98% of their range. And lastly, we have jack-10-8. This is a small blind versus button three bet pot. We can see, for example, a hand like ace-jack on jack-10-8 is currently ahead of about 90% of their range, uh, yet it only has 62% equity. Ace-ace is ahead of 93% of their range, it only has 69%. And again, these kind of spots where you have hands that are just way ahead of most of their range, but are actually have a lot less equity, well, that will indicate that it wants to take a very aggressive line, such as just shipping it on the flop. So what questions do you guys have about this? Anyone? What drives middling sizes, e.g. 75%? That's a good question, and to be honest, what is a middling size is kind of related to the SPR. I'm actually going to explore that very soon, though. So keep that question in mind. Sorry, is it FIDE? I'm going to get back to it. So anyway, this vulnerable nut theorem, it's something you can use in-game if you know you're going to be ahead of a large portion of their range, uh, and you also know that you don't have the equity that, to reflect that. That creates a huge incentive to bet aggressively because the value of fold equity is quite high. Your nutted hands can't be countered because they don't have better hands in range or enough better hands in range, and therefore you want to bet aggressively. Let's move on to the geometric bet size. Now, some of you may already know what this is, but to bet geometrically means to bet an equal fraction of the pot on each street to get all the chips in by the river. This is the ideal bet size when one player is perfectly polarized. In other words, uh, if you have only the absolute nuts or stone cold bluff and nothing in between and your opponent has bluff catchers, you'll want to bet an equal fraction on each street to get ranges in by the river. The reason for this is that this strategy maximizes villain's calling range. So here's what we might call a polarized range, right? The defender has middling hands. We have a polarized range. I'm not going to go over the exact math here, but in general, if you just run a simple MDF calculation, you can find that betting the same size on each street causes them to defend wider than if you were to vary your bet size. Now, in game, of course, you should vary your bet size, but we need to be aware of this mechanic to make sense of a lot of other spots. Let's talk about stack depth and felting ranges. So a felting range, or we call it a stack off range, is the portion of their range that can play for stacks. Right? If you get all the chips in uh, versus whatever they defend with, hands that are ahead in that case would be the part of the felting range. Now, it should be fairly intuitive that Deeper stacks lead to tighter felting ranges, and shorter stacks lead to wider felting ranges. Why is this? Well, you're putting in more money when stacks are deeper. And therefore, the range of hands you could stack off with needs to be able to put in more money, and your range is tighter. Conversely, you could also say that the amount of hands that have to defend versus all that extra money is a tighter range overall. So. This seems obvious to most people, but how can we measure this? How can we actually get a sense for what that percentage of range might be? Well, again, we can use minimum defense frequency calculations to get a rough idea of how wide felting ranges should be according to stack depth. So here's a situation. Uh, a graph I made where I've charted the stack to pot ratio on the bottom and the call down or the felting range on the y axis. Now, generally, the defending range is going to be somewhere between the MDF against a shove and the MDF against three streets of betting an equal fraction of the pot. So that's a little complex to look at, 
here's maybe something easier. For a single race pot, say button versus big blind, the stack off range is somewhere between 5 and 10%. For like a medium sized four bet pot, it's closer to 36, 43%. And we can see as the SPR goes down, more and more of the range has to be defended because there's less money to put in relative to the size of the pot. <clears throat> so for most single raise pots, you can say, okay, how well am I doing against the top 10% of their range? So here's an example. We have King Queen 9, button versus big blind single raise pot. In general, this flop prefers a smaller bet. So here's a question for you. Let's say you could open shove, just ship it. And you knew they would defend, the big blind would defend with the top 10% of their range. Knowing that, What's the weakest hand you stack off with? Some people are saying king nine, king queen nines. I don't know. It seems close, right? But we can uh, we can try and measure this. So. Here's the top 10% of big blinds range. And here's our equity against that top 10%. For your hand to be a value bet against that range, it needs to have at least 50% equity. Um, so would say king queen is ahead of that range. King nine is slightly behind. Now King nine could still maybe call as a bluff catch in a series of raises, but king queen would be ahead if you got it in. So this would be about the line of your stack off range, given that they're defending 10%. Again, this is all kind of abstract so far, but let's imagine that we remove all the jack 10 from big blinds range. Right? They still have everything else. We just remove the jack 10. How badly would that affect the strategy? No more straights. Right? We're taking away maybe somewhere between 12 and 16 combinations of straights from their range. Well, here's our equity against the top 10% of their range. This is the image you just saw. And here's that same image if we calculate the top 10% of their range after removing Jack-10. And we can see now that many more hands uh, fit into this category of you can stack off with this, right? Queen-9's almost there, King-9's there. Even Ace King and King Jack are almost close enough. So, how does this affect the actual strategy, though? Well, just removing that one nutted combo shifts the bet size dramatically. These blue lines are a baseline solve, the red lines are with Jack 10 removed from big blinds range. As we can see, the bet size increases drastically. We even th start throwing in this massive 160% overbet at some frequency. And that's the power of just a few nutted hands in range. Now, many more hands can play for stacks. So by removing the nutted hands, we open up the option to implement larger bet sizes because they'll be less exploitable. Big Blind is less able to counter those sizes. Notice that in the original one, we're mostly going somewhere between 25 and 40%, small sizes only, just a little bit of 80%. So what about 200 big blinds deep? Well, let's go back to GTO ranges, and let's see how it plays 200 big blinds deep. As you can see, mostly checking 67% of the time. Um, in this case, these are the simple ranges, so big lines force the check. But we can see that as the stack size increase, as the stack increases, as the SPR increases, uh, those nutted hands count for so much more. And 
that alone is going to make it much harder to implement a wide strategy. The nutted hands are the only defense against overbets. Removing too many nutted hands gives the opponent the option to overbet and apply a lot of pressure. Although that won't always be their best option, they'll have that option. And as stacks get deeper, the nut advantage becomes more important, right? That top 3% of their range counts for so much more when you're 200 big blinds deep because the stack off ranges are so much tighter. Let's move on to the question of how the middle of your range influences sizing. Here, we've got a funky spot. Cutoff versus small blind, 4-bet pot, flop is ace, 10, 9, two-tone. Why is small blind donking on ace, 10, 9? Shouldn't that be better for the 4-better? Very strange. Well, let's take a look. Why do you guys think that is? I haven't prepared a poll for this one, so feel free to just type in the chat. There we go. Why do you think it is that small blind likes the donk on ace-10-9? Nut advantage for out of position. Okay, interesting, interesting. All right, Sam G, can you see the ranges now? Yes. So it is interesting to see that they're donking here. About 40% of the time. And let's go back to the ranges for a second. Small blind, well, they have less EV and significantly less equity overall. If we look at the equity graph, we're the blue line. We do not have a range advantage. We don't really have a nut advantage either. You know, maybe a fraction of hands up there, but not really ahead in any meaningful sense. We do have, yeah, nines, tens, tens, nines. That's important to note. We just note these two pair hands. That's right. Of course, they have more aces, ace 10 and ace nine. Uh, so slightly more sets in two pair. But keep in mind the SPR is quite low here. So we have to consider, for example, top half of the range, top 50% or so. And even then, we're not doing fantastically. So. The main reason why it's donking here has to do with the middle of the range rather than the top or bottom. Every hand in our range is kind of worthless. It's either very valuable or completely worthless, right? Like eight, seven, sixes, these are worthless. Nines, tens, ten nines, ace, queen, ace, jack, very valuable. King, ten, no heart, worthless. King, ten with a heart, very valuable. Right? We don't have a whole lot of middling in-between hands worth protecting in here. So wouldn't the nut advantage exist more for in-position than out-of-position, donking because we have middle-strength hands that can extract and defend value? Right, so we actually don't have the nut advantage, not really, um, maybe a tiny bit. Definitely not the range advantage, and we're definitely behind. So the reason it's betting here has more to do with the fact that the middle of your range simply isn't worth protecting. Let's see what happens when we check and they bet, I don't know, say 25. You barely have a calling range. Most of your range is folding. Like we're way over folding here. The rest is raising. Um, it's important to keep in mind that part of the reason you check a lot is to defend your middling hands, right? If you don't really have a middling range, then you're, you're kind of naturally polarized, right? And so when all of our EV is split between very strong hands that want to put in money and completely worthless hands, even if we don't really have a range advantage, you still want to bet sometimes. So... The moral of the story is that no middling hands equals not really worth defending your checking range. Now, you won't see this often in single race pots, maybe on the river. It's a lot more common in four bet pots and situations where ranges are much tighter. Um, typically, you're going to have a few pocket pairs that are very valuable, 
a um, few over cards that are very valuable, and then a lot of trash. So this mechanic does pop up in uh, tighter ranges more often than not. What questions do you guys have about this? Are middling hands turned into donk bluffs usually here? Well, you don't really have a bunch of middling hands here, right? You have nothing hands and strong hands. What's the advantage for the range to donking? Let's go back here for a moment. So, you do have a lot of hands that are ahead, right? Ace, queen, ace, jack, tens, ten, nine, nines. And the reason is if you don't, um, if you just range check here, cutoff will be incentivized to check back most of their range. Um, and moreover, we have the option to bet. Why we opt for donk, not check, yeah. Yeah, you can see everyone is, uh, <laughs> Let me put it another way. When the middle of your range is not worth defending, you have the option to lead. The reason you're used to range checks in almost every situation where you check the preflop aggressor is because your the middle of your range needs to be defended. If you lead out too much value, all of a sudden your checking range becomes very exploitable. In this case, most of our checking range is worth nothing. It's zero EV even before they've made a bet. So it's not worth defending. Now, the advantage to leading out is that if you don't, they can just check back a lot and we lose some value. How not to overbluff here once we donk? Well, that's a matter of implementation. Continuum versus bet. Continuum versus bet to polarize, right? Is this related to mid-low connected boards in C? raise pot button versus big blind so i'm not sure what you mean by continuum to bet polar or continuing to bet polarized i think is what it says on the turn uh sure we can take a look there the, the sbr is very low so it can essentially shove some turns or try and drag it over three streets looks like it prefers dragging it over three streets in this case uh, now you guys can research this spot some more on your own but you will notice this quite a bit in your if you ever study four bet pots um, or after very polarized lines so you would continue donking on turn as well based on the logic you shared for the flop strategy yeah i mean by by leading the turn it's not really a donk anymore it's more of a c bet because you've already bet the flop but yeah um we take a look at turn reports if you like here it is leading on most and then on flush completing turns it is shipping it a lot if we develop a donking range, since we don't have a middling range worth defending, can't in position bet any two cards versus a check. What confuses me is that in position still opts the check back. Yeah, and that's because we're not donking all of our value, right? Um, our donking range is, or our checking range is very polarized here. We could take a look, right? We are checking some aces, we're checking some sets, we're checking all of our 10 9, uh, some strong top pair. So we're not donking all of our value, we're just donking some of it. And what's left in our checking range is a mixture of hands that have very low EV against their range and hands that have quite a bit of EV. So our checking range is naturally polarized. Now in this case, if we check, they're going to bet. And they're going to bet small, right? Most of the time they're for 10%, maybe 25%. And the thing is that even if they bet extremely small, we're still going to overfold massively versus this size, right? Like, what's the MDF against a 25% bet? Maybe 20% folds? We're folding 50. And you can see that reflected here. We don't really have much of a calling range, some weak ASEX, lots of raising. So, yeah, interesting spot. Always be aware that the middle of your range drags down your nutted hands. The middle of your range makes your value portion less aggressive because it needs to be defended. Can you pull up Ace King 7 complex? What's the reason behind betting 3%? Okay, sure. <laughs> 
Ace King Seven. Complex. You mean in uh, small blind versus what was this spot anyway? Is this small blind versus cutoff. Yeah. Small blind versus button. Okay. Ace, Ace, King, Seven. Let's graph that. Interesting. So it looks like this is a spot where every single size is somewhat playable. Um, if we just take a look at, say, the expected value, you do have a fair amount of everything in here. Uh, sorry, are you looking at a three-bet pot or a four-bet pot? I guess a four-bet pot is what I was looking at. Three percent bet. Interesting. So this looks more like the situation we're reviewing before. Lots of zero EV hands and lots of stronger hands. In general, the theory behind any block bet is that it's an equity realization play um, because typically they're going to, you're going to face less aggression leading out than you would checking and facing a bet. Now, the reason you don't normally implement it is, again, uh, the fact that your checking range can become more exploitable. Uh, your range is a little more exposed when you split right on the flop out of position. But when that's not the case, often the option becomes available to start developing a leading range. All right, let me get back to my presentation here. Now that we understand how the middling part of your range relates to the rest of your range, let's keep going. I want to talk about paired boards for a moment. Throughout this lecture, we've been talking about dry or wet boards. Is a flop like Ace A6 Rainbow dry? I mean, it should be. It sounds like a pretty dry board, but what exactly does dry mean? Can anyone tell me? Is it uh does it mean there's not a lot of draws? Does it mean something else? Perhaps it means there's not a lot of nutted hands. Most range low equity. Less equity change on future streets. Equity is unlikely to change turn river. Polarized. Little to no connection. Hands in range. Yeah. And the truth is people have <laughs> different definitions of this stuff. Um, I think I really like the idea that there's uh, equities are less likely to change on turn and river. You could also say that fewer parts of the range can outdraw the top of the range, um, or little to no connection to hands in the range. That's also good. So, what about Ace A6 Rainbow? Now, this is pretty much a range bet board, but why is it a range bet board? Why do you bet small, unpaired boards and single raise pots? I'm going to launch another poll here. Just want to get your guys' ideas. And you guys have mentioned some good options that I haven't inc included in this poll, but got to start somewhere. Risk reward ratio is high. Well, that's an interesting one, actually. Okay, so what do we have here? I think most people think Big Blinds has many weekends and will under defend versus bet. Okay, interesting. So let's test some of these theories. Now, I noticed that no one picked too many nutted hands to contend with. And we don't feel that way because Ace A6 should belong to the button. After all, we're range betting. Shouldn't we be at a massive advantage here? I mean, it looks like we are, right? Most of our range is ahead. We have a big range advantage, but we don't have that nut advantage, right? And that's because Big Blind has 
a ton of ASEX in their range. So what ends up happening is it's hard to get too aggressive with anything that's not trips here because as soon as you overextend and start betting huge with, say, pocket kings, you know, five, six, stuff like that, well, all of a sudden they can start countering you with a huge portion of their range, which is trips. But okay, let's run some experiments. I'm going to run four experiments on this flop. What happens if we remove all the trips from both ranges? What happens if we remove some trash from big blinds range? I'm going to measure the value of fold equity. And from there, I'm also going to reverse the positions and see if the trends remain the same. So the idea behind this is just to run a battery of tests. Just kind of test a few of our assumptions about why this is a small bet. So go ahead and make some predictions here. This time there's a few different questions. And we're going to see how the strategy changes as we tweak the parameters. Two people responded so far. Well, I'll keep this open. Oh, we got a third one. Interesting. So let's take a look at the first one. What happens if we remove trips plus from both ranges? That is to say, all the sets and the boats are removed from both ranges and we resolve with that structure. And so far, people have guessed basically throughout the board here, right? Some people are saying check small. Check more smaller size, range bet small size, range bet bigger size, over bet. So the full range of predictions are here. Let's take a look. So again, the blue line is just my original solve. That's the baseline. And the red are is button strategy with trips removed. And as you can see, it sizes up drastically. Right? It's still checking about the same amount, but now we're using 80% and 120% bets. Um, so a massive increase in, uh, in sizing. And that's mostly due to the fact that these trips prevent the rest of our range from getting too aggressive. Once you remove that barrier, once you remove these nutted hands up here, all of a sudden, all of that becomes a massive nut advantage that allows you to implement a big bet strategy. So would we say then that it's because the board is so dry or more that we can't get too out of line with huge bets because there's so many trips in range that can counter anything that's not trips in our range? Okay, so next we we'll remove some trash from big blinds range. Basically, I've gone on to GTO Wizard, I've selected, uh, I've removed the trash range, anything with less than 25% equity. How will this affect our strategy on the button? And again, we're kind of split down the middle here. Some are saying check more smaller size, some are saying check more bigger size. Obviously, you should check more because their range is stronger. Um, but the question of sizing then becomes an issue. Should you check or bet more now that their range is tighter? Should you size up or size down? Well, you should size up. So here we can see we're checking more now that the range is tighter. That makes sense. And I'll also point out that they do donk about 30% of the time for one third size. I gave them that option. Um, but when they check to us, we're betting bigger, much bigger. And this is because we've increased the value of fold equity and we're now targeting some stronger hands. Right? Before, we were targeting these very low value, very weak hands. But now that we've made the range stronger, we're targeting higher equity hands. We're targeting 6x, we're targeting king x, we're targeting these pocket pairs. And you see this again, uh, you'll see this in 3-bet pots and 4-bet pots a lot on paired boards. It'll often size up because the target is shifted away from air and towards medium strength hands. And that causes us to use a larger bet size. So next. I wanted to measure the value of fold equity. And the way I do this is I simply measure 
the equity with the made hands in our range against their folding range. So on the left here, that's our equity against hands that'll fold versus 125% pod bet, according to GTO Wizard, right? So we'll notice that, for example, a hand like Ace Deuce has 97% against the range that folds, almost 98. So when this hand overbets, it's not doing so for any protection, right? It gains almost nothing from those folds because the hands that fold had almost no equity against us. A hand like, for example, 6x will gain more, but surprisingly not that much. Even a hand like kings, right? You overbet huge, kings gains, you know, it has, the hands that fold have maybe 4% against kings. This is the same thing except against a 33% pot bet. So again, we can see that the value of fold equity is not very high. We have massive equity against their folding range, which means the hands they fold were very much dominated by us in the first place. So ace a6, the value of fold equity is quite low. That's why when we removed part of these trash hands from their range, it started to size up because the value of fold equity is higher now. We're targeting stronger hands. These hands have more equity against the top of our range. Lastly, I just reversed the positions. Mostly just out of curiosity. Most people predicted it would size up, which uh, is correct. You can see it shifts from mostly a small bet strategy sl using some slightly bigger bets. And the reason for this is because in positions range, which remember, this is now but big blinds range. I've reversed the positions. Uh, in general, in position has more EV, which increases the value gained from folds. Interesting exper experiment. Uh, I ran a few others with some other flops I can show you guys. Uh, I guess we should summarize first though. Ace A6, what happens when we remove trips plus from both ranges? We size up significantly. What happens when we remove some trash? Sizing up again, but also checking a lot more. What's the value of fold equity? Very low for most made hands. Um, the hands that fold have virtually no equity against the value portion of our range. And if we reverse the positions, we size up slightly because the EV of their hands goes up a bit in position. Therefore, the value of fold equity increases slightly as well. All right, that was a lot to take in. Uh, before I proceed, let me hear your questions. Okay, no questions. So I ran similar test for queen a3 mono. Again, it's button versus big blind. So we'll launch a similar poll here. Make some predictions. Firstly, we have to take a look at the ranges. What happens if we remove mate flushes from both ranges? What happens if we remove some trash from big blinds range? What's the value of fold equity? What happens if we reverse the positions? Tools Boy asks a great question. Am I mistaken, but I thought there is no incentive to size up bets if the fold equity is low. Am I wrong? Oh, you are correct, sir. You are correct. Um, I wouldn't say no incentive. I would say that there is less incentive. Let's go back here for a moment. So. For example, here, you're not betting so much to gain fold equity as you are to get called in this case. And the reason it sizes up so much when we remove trips from both ranges is because of this massive nut advantage that will stack the top of their range. So fold equity is certainly a big part of it. Uh, the other half of the equation is getting called by worse. Perfect. So let's go back here for a second. Now, monotone boards are interesting. Um, I feel like many beginner players, they're using that level one heuristic, you know, wet board, bet big, and they'll just start potting it on these monotone boards. Um, 
And the reason you don't do that, of course, is that if you're overplaying, you're overextending on these boards, you're going to narrow their range too quickly. Uh, your own ranges are going to be quite exploitable. You're going to be overextended with stuff like top pair and two pair. And if you play too aggressively, they can counter you and really destroy most of your value with raises. People associate monotone boards with very small bet sizes, not much raising, small raises. But the truth is that if you get unbalanced in these spots, the solver will just start, you know, 5x potting it. It'll just start overbetting like crazy if you cap yourself too badly. Um, so these kind of boards are very precarious, uh, highly exploitable if one player slips up. So with that in mind, Take a look at the range distribution here. You can see that because of the abundance of flushes in both ranges, no one really has the nut advantage. Button has a slight range advantage throughout, but no nut advantage. Now, because of that, it's typically going to prefer a smaller size. So what happens if we remove made flushes from both ranges? More betting and sizing up seems to be winning. Let's find out. Yeah, so it's a little bit less betting, but massively sizing up, right? I keep in mind, I've gotten rid of both players' flushes, not just one player. And that's about six, seven percent of each range. But now instead of betting, you know, 25%, it's preferring something between 80 and 120. In fact, this when you remove the flushes, it plays closer to Queen A3 two tone, uh, which the solver will overbet at a reasonable frequency. So again, the amount of nuts in each range kind of dictates how large you can play. In this case, when we got rid of all these nutted flushes well now you're up against an extremely draw heavy range um you have an advantage and so because they have very few hands you know there's only like three percent two pairs in sets now they don't have a whole bunch of nutted hands to counter you with and you have a lot of incentive to bet uh well when that's the case you typically want to size up so Here's the same one, removed trash from big blinds range. Now, what happens if we remove some trash? Kind of, everyone kind of agreed, size up, less betting. Um, in this case, I guess I didn't really give you the option for the same amount of betting, but about the same amount of betting overall, but definitely sizing up. And it's the same reason as last time, right? If we remove trash, all of a sudden our target shifts to stronger hands, the value of fold equity is higher, so we bet bigger to target these stronger hands. Here I've measured the equity against their folding range. On the left is versus an overbet. On the right is versus a 33% bet. Uh, I'm just showing buttons made hands excluding flushes because flushes have almost 100% against the folding range. So we can see that there is some decent fold equity here, right? Like no hand is really that safe. Um, every hand gains something, even if using a small size and more so with a large size. So there's definitely some reasonable fold equity to be gained on queen eight three. Lastly, I reverse the positions again, just kind of out of curiosity. Um, Now, most people predicted sizing up, less betting. In this case, there is significantly less betting and kind of sizing down. Um, and this is related to the exploitability of, um, of your range. Again, I mentioned at the start that queen a3, highly exploitable if one player gets out of line, if one player caps themselves. Um, and moreover, the value of implied odds withdraws uh, goes up, oh, where was I? Yeah, the value of implied odds 
goes up tremendously in position, which is a major advantage on monotone boards. So experimental outcomes. If we remove flushes, again, we size up significantly. If we remove trash, we size up again, but also checking more. The value of fold equity is kind of low to medium, depending on the size, uh, but it's still a reasonable amount of fold equity and checking a lot more if we reverse the positions. Okay, last one, no poll for this one. I think you guys have the gist. So Jack 95 two-tone. Uh, now at the beginning of this lecture, I told you there was dry boards, super wet boards, and then these kind of in-between boards that just make for the perfect large bets, right? If queen a3 was on the right, super wet, and ace a6 was on the left, super dry, this one's just in between. There's many draws, there's no made flushes or straights. Um, why is a large bet preferred on this board? Well, you could say a lot of reasons. I think part of it's related to that heuristic I shared earlier. Uh, the board is somewhere in between just draw heavy enough to want to bet big. We have enough of an advantage to try and bet big. It does implement an overbet range as well as a 75% bet range. Let's explore this a bit in GTO Wizard. Right. So we can see we do have, uh, you know, a small equity advantage, reasonable EV advantage. Um, if we look at the equity graph. We're not, you know, we have a range advantage. But importantly, what I want to point out here is that Big Blind only has 3.4% of hands that are two pair plus, right? That means if you have Ace Jack, you're ahead of like 97% of their range right now. Doesn't mean you have that much equity, of course, but you are currently ahead of that many hands. Right? And whenever you see that heuristic, typically the strategy is going to be to bet big. And indeed, it does prefer an overbet or at least a large bet with most of its value range. So I ran some similar experiments. What happens if we remove all the two pair plus from both ranges? What happens if we add a bunch of draws to big blinds range? What is the value of fold equity? Removing all the two pair plus. We see, again, it sizes up significantly. Uh, even this small range is enough to counter too much overbetting. And here we start to implement this 160% size. Extra draws. We can see that um, we are betting less often because basically what I did was I gave them all the flush draws, 10, 8, and queen, 8, and full. Sorry, 10, 8, and queen, 10, and full. So they have all the draws, uh, which increases our incentive to bet large, but decreases our advantage. So we check more often, and when we do bet, we use a larger size. Value of fold equity. Um, well, on the left, we can see that it's quite high, right? Even our very nutted hands, you know, even something like ace jack only is 85%. And that's against the hands that fold, right? So there's some pretty reasonable fold equity going on with this one, but not as much if we bet small. Just recapping it here. So in conclusion, bet sizing is complicated. The incentives around bet sizing largely relate to nut advantage and the value of fold equity. The SPR and the portion of nutted hands in each range dictates which hand can play for stacks, which ultimately controls bet sizing. The middle of your range acts as an anchor, which the top of your range must adequately defend. It's dragging down some of the value hands because the middle of your range must be defended. Fold equity acts as an incentive to bet. If you only fold out hands that have no equity against the value portion of your range, then the value of fold equity is quite low. And the opposite is, of course, also true. Anyways, that's it for my lecture, guys. Uh, please on any questions you may have, I'd be happy to answer. Middling sizing, what would make us choose it in general, Fide asked. Um, that's a good question. I didn't put this in my presentation, although I thought about it, but typically when you have a large range advantage throughout the middle of your range, 
You have a lot of middling hands that are incentivized to put money in. Typically, that's going to indicate more of a smaller sizing. Sorry, you're asking not middling hands, middling sizing. I would say that middling sizing is what happens when the incentives are somewhat balanced between a larger size and a smaller size. Yeah, I suppose I only really showed extreme examples here, but perhaps in the future I can demonstrate some more of the middling sizes. Thank you for coming, everyone. I uh, really appreciate your support. And of course, if you have any questions, just let me know. We've got some more questions here. Do you recommend simple solution of 3366 and 130 or general? I find it difficult to know when to use 50% size. Uh, personally, I like the general solutions, but it, to each their own. Um, really depends what you're trying to do. If you're going for implementation, then simpler is often better. If you're trying to find trends, then often you'll want more sizes to get a better idea of how the spot works and changes. But that's a subjective question, really, to each their own. All right, guys, I think we can end it here. Uh, have yourself a great Thursday, a great night, or Friday morning, wherever you are, and good luck on the grind.